Pope Francis had lots to say about traditional Catholics and Catholic practice this week. He's also cracking down on the formation of new religious associations and named a new bishop to an important diocese in the southwestern U.S. Here to unpack these stories and more, I'm joined by liturgist and author of The Road from Hyperpapalism to Catholicism, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. Peter, thank you for being here. While there is much talk of accompaniment and inclusiveness from the Pope, um, this is what he said about traditional Catholics before a group of Jesuit editors. We'll put it up on the screen. Restorationism has come to gag the council. The number of groups of restorers, for example, in the United States, there are many, is significant. The problem is precisely this. In some contexts, the council has not yet been accepted. It is also true that it takes a century for a council to take root. We still have 40 years to make it take root then." End quote. Peter, uh, first of all, where has the council not been accepted, and how is one to discern that? Yes, it, it, it's actually quite ironic. Whenever you hear someone of Pope Francis's generation or, uh, or, or disposition talk about not accepting the council, uh, you have to ask them, you know, do they accept the council? I mean, after all, uh, Sacro Sanctum Concilium said Latin should be retained. It said Gregorian chant should have pride of place. Yeah. Uh, it mentioned not yeah. a word about turning the priest towards the people or having altar girls or having extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion, and so, and on and on and yeah. on. So, in fact, the Second Vatican Council is not being implemented precisely by the people who are claiming that the traditional Catholics are not following the Second Vatican Council. So there's a there's a game going on here of who gets to to claim Vatican II. Um, it just goes back to what Benedict XVI said about the hermeneutic of rupture and the hermeneutic of continuity. Yeah, no, that's a that's a, a crucial point, uh, Peter. I've always said, uh, you know, a Latin mass where the uh, the gospel is proclaimed in English and the homily is in English, that is closer to the vision of the Second Vatican Council, where the people are active and responding, than many things that we claim some claim are the fulfillment of the council vision. Talk to me about this labeling traditional Catholics as restorers. Uh, yes, th this yes. almost sounds like a play on Pope Benedict, uh, who was a pope, as I recall, who talked about the reform of the reform. Is this a formal rebuke of that reform of the reform vis-a-vis -vis the uh, liturgy? Well, it's certainly a rebuke of Joseph Ratzinger and Benedict XVI's whole vision, because what he desired was to see um, the traditions of the Church that the, that the Second Vatican Council had never condemned and had no intention of eliminating that they should be recovered mm -hmm. and appreciated again. I mean, this is Sumorum Pontificum and, and many other documents of his magisterium that I could name. I mean, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do want to restore all kinds of things. We want to restore worship eastwards, ad orientem. We want to restore Rogation days and Ember days. We want to restore Latin and Gregorian chant. We want to restore sacred music and sacred architecture. All of these things were praised, either praised by the council or not even mentioned by the council. Hmm. Peter, I, I have a I have a better restoration. I just want to restore people back to the pews. They're gone. Nobody's <laughs> there. That's what I mean. They're fighting over these these you know uh, furnishings and music and wanting to you know expel tradition. Nobody is in your church. Nobody cares. And and I think they've failed to get the wake up call here. That you know they're talking to themselves and suddenly look out and there's no one there but a few acolytes who you know are are, are applauding for them, which raises an interesting question. From where or from whom is Pope Francis getting these very warped depictions of what he calls significant numbers of American Catholics, not only the traditional Latin community, but just run-of-the-mill uh, uh, pious Catholics? I mean, he, he often very pointedly singles out the United States when making these observations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, what, what you saw in the comments to the Jesuits are, in a sense, two of his favorite punching bags, right? America and the traditional Catholics, though he put them together. Um, no, I, I mean, I think, I think the problem is, frankly, that uh, for, for Pope Francis and for many people of, of his way of thinking, um, 
the Second Vatican Council became this kind of super dogma or the only council, and it wasn't even the council, but the spirit of the council, all that it represented mm -hmm. to them, all that it meant, this liberation from the past, this rethinking and even rejection of tradition. Um, that's what it represents. When they talk about Vatican II, they don't mean really the 16 documents of the council. They mean the spirit that mm -hmm. was unleashed by it, this almost uh, Shiva-like spirit of destruction um, and, and, uh, and renovation, recovation. Um, and so if you have, let's say, a, a family of homeschooling Catholics in America who attend the Novus Ordo, but they homeschool their children with the Baltimore Catechism, he's talking about those people too. I mean, what, what they're doing is wrong in his sight because it suggests that there was a Catholic church prior to 1962, that there was, um, you know, solid dogma and, and, and faith and morals and devotions and so on prior to the council that were good and holy and legitimate and that we can keep them, right? Yeah, well, I, you know, uh, it, it pains me the Pope, A, hasn't visited the United States more. I mean, he's only been here one time for six days in his entire life. Um, th that deprives you of a certain sensibility and sensitivity to the people there. I mean, it's like me trying to pontificate on, you know, what happens in Mozambique. I, 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 I've, I've never been there. Uh, he also sees this moment in the church when you read that, uh, his little uh, Fiverino to the Jesuit editors. He reads this moment in the church and I think casts himself as... Jesuit superior Pedro Arupe, who was the uh, superior of the Jesuit order just after the council, this was a man, incidentally, who was reprimanded not only by John Paul II, who almost suppressed the order, but Paul VI himself, who last time I checked was the man who, who uh, affirmed the council, he too wrote letters decrying the Jesuit drift in morals, in orthodoxy, and in fidelity to the pope all of yes. which Arupe sort of looked the other way on. So it is curious that this is the figure that uh, is sort of being held up as a, as a patron saint, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I quite agree. I mean, the Jesuits suffered a catastrophic decline uh, in their numbers, in their morale, in their, in their theology. I mean, they became infested with, with modernism. Uh, and this is exactly the point that you're, that you're making. I mean, what, what, what we're, unfortunately, I think what you see is, um, you know, there's there's the view of the council that it was supposed to modernize the Catholic Church, bring it into line with with contemporary Western society. Um, in a certain sense, that just became secularizing the church, and that's what happened to the Jesuits. They they became involved in liberation mm. theology, for example, and started to mingle Marxism and Christianity. Um, I'm not saying that the Pope is doing that particularly, but but it, it's this general idea of the modernized church is somehow supposed to attract modern people. Well, that experiment's been tried for 50 years now, and it doesn't seem to be working at all. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. When when does the experiment end, when there's no one left listening? I mean, that's that's my, I just well, look at it. It's just like an audience, you know? If I, did, if I did this show every week and no one showed up, at what point do you <laughs> stop broadcasting? I mean, you know, and if there was no one there, I just wouldn't do this. I don't need to keep doing this. And I, and I, I feel the same way. This is your job. You have one job. Just protect this doctrine and extend it, broadcast it. Let other people know about it, because it is, if, if it is what you claim it is, the hope of the world and the salvation of mankind, that's kind of a big marching order. I, I want to move on. We're almost out of time. In addition to negatively labeling some Catholics restorers, Pope Francis recently commented to priests and bishops in Sicily that he had seen pictures of some of them celebrating Mass in lace vestments. And he said, where are we 60 years after the Council? Some updating is needed, even in liturgical art and liturgical fashion. Yes, sometimes bringing some of grandma's lace goes. It's to pay homage to grandma, right? It's good to pay homage to grandma, but it's better to celebrate the mother, the Holy Mother Church, and do so how Mother Church wants to be celebrated, end quote. Peter, um, this is... What, what, what is he trying to say there? Well, I mean, it, it's, I mean, apart from the, the problems of coherence in what he's saying, I mean, the most basic problem there is that Vatican II and the rubrics of the, of the, of the liturgy say nothing about the styles of vestments, whether it's Roman or Gothic, whether you have a plain alb or a lace alb. It's as if he's thinking that Vatican II has outlawed anything 
that was characteristic of the church prior to the Second Vatican Council. He's not getting that from the council. He's not getting it from the Novus Ordo's uh, rubrics, right? Um, I mean, that's that, 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 there's, a, there's a kind of um, um, obsession there. And it's ironic that uh, St. Francis, whom he took as his patron saint, uh, is the patron saint of lace makers because Francis wore a lace alb and we actually have his lace alb in a museum. That's right. That's right. I'd forgotten that. This is the, I, I'd totally forgotten that, but I didn't know he was a patron saint of lace makers. That's fascinating. It's curious that while Rome laments tradition, Peter, and order, what I imagine they consider the embrace of the council liturgically is happening all over the world. I mean, this is a liturgy in San Diego. It appears a woman is playing the role of the deacon, a deaconess, and that, that behind her is soon to be Cardinal McElroy presiding there. And here is an example of what passes for a guitar mass in Illinois. Now, I, I will note that uh, no one is cracking down on these liturgical displays, Peter, and it is this uh, embrace of uh, their imagining of the council that's brought us to this point. And here's Germany, home of the Synodal Way. Look at this, clown mass, full-on clown mass. <laughs> now, I'm not sure what the rubric say about a priest processing up and down the aisles on a hoverboard, but that doesn't seem to matter to this priest. And here is a post-council Pentecost Sunday mass in a Chicago parish, complete with bubbles. Peter, your reaction to this uh, America's Got No Talent lunacy, is this the mass the Vatican Council envisioned, and does this inspire unity or draw a new young vibrancy to the church? No, no, of course not. I mean, most if you look at these videos, most of the people attending are what you could call aging hippies. Um, but even, even apart from that, Vatican II said, and I quote, no innovations should be introduced unless the good of the church genuinely and certainly requires them. That's in the document on the liturgy. Um, clear, clearly, when, when Pope Francis and Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict, they've all lamented and they've wrung their hands about abuses in the Novus Ordo, but they've actually taken almost no steps to correct any of these abuses. All of these things are contrary to the rubrics and they're also just contrary to good mm. taste and to sanity and to Catholic sensibilities. Um, but no steps are taken to address them, uh, whereas there's, an, there's, an, there's a frontal assault on Catholics who love Mass eastwards in Latin and with chant. I think that tells us all we need to know, really. Wow. You know, you know Peter, uh, I was, I'm, I'm in New York, and I was thinking the other day, if someone showed up and staged Bohème at the Metropolitan Opera House and attempted to slip in some Celine Dion or rap in the middle of the show, people would rend their garments, throw their tickets down and storm out. and There'd be an outcry. Yet this is what happens at masses all over the world. The, 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 the rules, the established protocols, the form of it is totally distorted. Nobody says anything. And then you have people who are adhering to the tradition, delivering the expected, the body of Christ, nothing small there, and yet uh, they are persecuted. It makes very little sense to me. But the, the, the worst part of all are the, the conservative priests who are neither celebrating the traditional Latin mass nor the clown mass, but are just trying to follow the simple rubrics that, that they're given in the book. And they're trying to do it in the, right. with the mentality of Vatican II. And, th and those people are also being attacked now by bishops and cardinals. Hmm. I want to move on to some news made by Cardinal-elect Arthur Roche. He's the prefect of the Dicastery of Divine Worship. This is the liturgy office at the Holy See. And he's reflecting on the state of the liturgy and sacraments and the Pope's restrictions of the Latin Mass. Listen to this. So all that is taking place is the regulation of the former liturgy of 1962 Missal by uh, stopping the, the promotion of that. Because it was clear that the council, the bishops of the council, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, were putting forward a new liturgy for the vital life of the church, for its vitality. And that's really very important. And to resist that, is, is something that is really quite serious, too. Your thoughts on the words of uh, Cardinal-elect Roche there? Yes. Yeah, well, you know, the, the funny thing is that whenever people attribute, first of all, 
they attribute all of the work of the Second Vatican Council to the Holy Spirit, which is not technically what anybody has ever claimed about an ecumenical council. We certainly invoke the Holy Spirit for guidance, uh, but the liturgical reform that followed after the council was something different from the Second Vatican Council, and in fact, contrary to it in many ways, all that one has to do is watch you know, episode two of the Mass of the Ages to get the story about that. It just appeared a month ago. Um, and so it, in point of fact, what, what Archbishop Roach is not acknowledging is that everyone in the history of the church saw the 2000 year organic development of the Catholic liturgy as the work of the Holy Spirit. Is that all suddenly not the work of the Holy Spirit? Is, is the Holy Spirit only working now uh, and, and in the rejection of what the Holy Spirit used to do? I mean, this starts to sound very incoherent. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense theologically. Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we know, look, we know there was, the Holy Spirit was operable, and the last two pontificates, John Paul and Benedict, who were actually at the Second Vatican Council, unlike more contemporary figures, they saw what was needed, and they moved the church down this path of reform, wheeling, trying to pull back some of these abuses and remind people of that true vision. But now we're back to the spirit of Vatican II, which is basically a do-it-yourself. It's a do-it-yourself exactly. liturgy. Yes. In fact, Joseph Ratzinger wrote a letter to Wolfgang Waldstein in 1974. It's been published. I talk about it in, in a number of places, uh, where he said, Ratzinger said, I was at the council the whole time. I listened to every speech. I've read all of the speeches over again, and I can tell you for sure that what has happened in the liturgy is not what the Council Fathers wanted and what they voted for. Mm. Anybody reading the documents would know that. In fact, I think I'm going to yes. post them. Next week, I'm going to read chunks of them because I do think <laughs> people have no, they just have no facility or understanding of it. Nobody reads the Second Vatican Council documents. Let's face it, Peter, mom and dad are not sitting around. They're trying to make ends meet, and it's lucky if they can drag the kids, get everybody dressed, and make it into church on time. And now we're asking them to become, you know, liturgists and, and Vatican II experts, but we'll do that. For the sake of the, the audience, I'm going to do that. We're going to put excerpts up and maybe have you and others back to explain. But uh, Pope Francis made a significant appointment here in the U.S. recently. He accepted the resignation of Bishop Thomas Olmsted of Phoenix, um, who really rebuilt that diocese after a very difficult period. Uh, he named Auxiliary Bishop of San Diego John Dolan. Now, Dolan's boss, uh, McElroy, was just named a cardinal. What could the appointment of Bishop John Dolan mean to the liturgy in the Diocese of Phoenix in the future? Olmsted really w was, a, was somebody who was quite orthodox and saved that diocese after a very traumatic period. Yes, it's true. Bishop Olmsted, I, I always uh, hold him dear in my heart because years and years ago he gave a talk in which he said that uh, we should all kneel for Holy Communion. And then he quoted a desert father who said, the devil has no knees. That's how you can recognize the devil. Mm. Uh, but but in terms of what what this yeah. means, I mean, I don't know much about uh, about Bishop Dolan. Um, unfortunately, if he's a protege of of uh, of McElroy, that tells us uh, that could tell us a lot. Um, you know, Bishop McElroy, of course, is somebody who was uh, a collaborator with McCarrick and knew all about the McCarrick situation. And so it's a real slap in mm -hmm. the face of Catholics everywhere, especially abused Catholics, that Pope Francis is daring to elevate uh, McElroy to the cardinalate. Um, you know, that's that's a huge mm -hmm. insult. So I, I think that the, the Catholics of Phoenix are are potentially in for a very difficult time and they're going to need to, uh, to to get down on their knees, use those Christian knees uh, and, and <laughs> pray and pray for help. Yeah, I, I want to get your take finally on the pope's decree issued this week. This is a major story. Uh, it requires written permission of the Vatican before any diocesan bishop can approve the establishment of new religious associations or organizations in the diocese. In the Vatican's words, quote, a public association of the faithful with a view to becoming an institute of consecrated life or a society of apostolic life of diocesan right. Peter, the layman doesn't appreciate the import of this. What does this mean to fledgling religious communities, traditionally, yes. traditional ones who are predominantly the only ones being created? Exactly right. As somebody pointed out, uh, do you see new religious communities being formed around guitars and felt banners? No, that, that's not where the vocations are coming. Um, no, this is a huge story. It's huge because um, it's, it's part of a pattern in recent years of the Pope 
on the one hand, talking about the importance of decentralization and synodality, and on the other hand, taking bigger and bigger steps to centralize important decisions in Rome and to take them mm -hmm. away from local bishops. Traditionalist Custodes, for example, said uh, that it was it was it was doing what it did in the name of giving bishops more freedom over the liturgy, but actually it took away freedoms that they had under some more pontificum, and it only gave them the freedom mm -hmm. to suppress and to harm. And so similarly with this move, mm -hmm. um, what it means is that a bishop is no longer judged competent to discern spiritually the charisms that God is raising up in his own backyard, but he has to, to ask people thousands of miles away from other countries who are not even sympathetic with him, or might even have uh, an opposite point of view, now they need to give their written permission for his own discernment. I mean, let me just read you a short passage um, from Lumen Gentium okay. from Vatican II, speaking about faith, fidelity to Vatican II. Lumen Gentium number 27, the pastoral office or the habitual and daily care of their sheep is entrusted to the local bishops completely, nor are they to be regarded as vicars of the Roman pontiffs, for they exercise an authority that, that is proper to them. In virtue of this power, bishops have the sacred right and the duty before the Lord to make laws for their subjects, to pass judgment on them, and to moderate everything pertaining to the ordering of worship and the apostolate. That's mm. Vatican II, the, Lumen Gentium, number 27. Yeah, well, Peter, it just, again, there's an incoherence here. The Pope talks about having the smell of the sheep, but apparently it doesn't matter if you have the smell of the sheep, because a bureaucrat in Rome is going to tell the bishop what his sheep should be doing. This makes no sense. Again, it's a detached, it's a, it's a fatherlessness, because you're, you're basically depriving the people of the present father and assuming those powers in some far-off land. And it makes, it just makes no sense. You're not in contact with the people in this particular diocese at this particular time. So it's best to leave that to the bishop. Or, I mean, you chose the bishop, you've, you've entrusted yes. this bishop, so let him operate his office. Exactly. I mean, the, the, bishops, uh, the bishops are not branch managers of Vatican Inc., which is headed by a mm. CEO in Rome. Right? The bishops are successors of the apostles, just like the pope is, and they all belong to the apostolic college. They all have an equal dignity yeah. as successors of the apostles. Hmm. Peter, we will leave it there. The Road from Hyperpapalism to Catholicism, Volumes 1 and 2, by Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, is available now at bookstores everywhere and online. Thank you for being here. Thank you.